Welcome, Vistage members and guests. I'm Dave Nelson, a 14-year member of Vistage in the Pittsburgh area, part of CE676, and your Fridays with Vistage host. Today we're discussing why people leave, decoding the engagement challenge. Our expert guests today are Mike Zani and Greg Barnett. Hey, uh, Mike and Greg, welcome back to Fridays with Vistage. Good to be back. Thank you. And by the way, I say welcome back because on August 26th, Mike and Greg were with us talking about improving your sales team's health and performance. So in case you missed that session, I tried this this morning. If you sign into My Vistage and just search for Mike's last name, which is Z-A-N-I, that's a really usefully unique last name, Z-A-N-I. Look at the second result, and you can listen to that webinar from last August, a great, uh, great session. So quick introduction. Mike Zani is the CEO of the Predictive Index, or PI, as we refer to it. He's based in the greater Boston area, and he provides the overall strategic direction for the organization with emphasis on global growth and product development to drive outstanding client results. Mike is an avid sailor, such a nice part of the country to be sailing, and uh, he began his career in marketing and sales with Vanguard Sailboats and was a coach for the 1996 U.S. Olympic sailing team. He has a B.S. from Brown University and an M.B.A. from Harvard. Greg Barnett is VP of, Business, uh, uh, VP of Research and Development at PI, Predictive Index, and he's responsible in that role for setting and executing PI's scientific agenda and leading the company's R&D department in the development, maintenance, and delivery of the Predictive Index's science-based behavioral and skills assessment. Prior to joining the Predictive Index, Greg was a senior managing consultant in IBM's Workforce Sciences and Analytics Division. He has a Ph.D. and M.A. in Industrial Organizational Psychology from the University of Tulsa and a B.A. with Honors in Psychology from the University of Colorado. Now, during our webinar today, if you have questions, please type them in the WebEx Q&A panel. We're going to pick them up at the end. We'll answer as many as we can. So we're going to start with Mike Zani. Mike, let's talk about why people leave. Great. Thank you, Dave. Actually, uh, Dave, I am uh, really just introducing, uh, you know, Greg, um, Dr. Greg. We're so lucky to have um, uh, him presenting with us today. He has a uh, wealth of knowledge about culture and engagement uh, for companies large and small that he developed when he was in Connexus or IBM's Connexus division. Um, Greg, why don't you set this up on, you know, what is engagement and uh, one of our favorite topics of what is engagement and why people leave. Thanks, Mike. Um, good afternoon and good morning to everybody. I'm always excited to talk about this topic, and we're going to start with just really the idea of what is engagement. If, everywhere you turn nowadays, you probably see the word. It shows up in marketing. It shows up uh, new products, new technology. Everything is trying to tell you about how to get better engagement. And whether it's webinars like this or survey solutions, the idea gets quite a bit cloudy at times. What is it? Is it just another buzzword? Is it the latest HR craze? Is it something truly meaningful that you should pay attention to? So we're gonna we're here to straighten that out and then talk about what to do about it. Now, one of the things we're gonna start with here is exploring what engagement isn't. Um, you know, there are a lot of myths about engagement. A lot of it gets confusing. And one of the things that having been out there working in the engagement space for a while is you, you hear some of those myths. One of them is, is engagement just about being happy? And the idea that business leaders say, you know, I really don't just want a bunch of happy, lazy employees. So, no, engagement is not about that at all. Others think engagement is just about job satisfaction, and they picture employees being satisfied when their workloads are low and when they're stress-free. And while job satisfaction has a small part to do with engagement, it, it isn't the only piece. Engagement is a lot bigger. Others just think about engagement and think, ah, that's those companies that try to put foosball tables in and free food. But again, that really wasn't, isn't what engagement is at all. Engagement is actually something quite a bit bigger. It's really this idea of a deep emotional commitment that employees have both to the company and to the company's goals. So this is about thinking about psychological ownership. 
not just being an employee, but feeling emotionally connected to the company, the mission, the strategy, the people, the customers, and all the other things you'd want to see from employees in your organization. So take a second and let that sink in. Why wouldn't you want every employee feeling psychological ownership for the company that they work in and they come to every day? Now let me sort of take you a little bit into what really engagement does here. And on this page at the heart of engagement, we talk a lot about the idea of, of kind of this commitment to the organization and its goals being described in terms of something called discretionary effort. Discretionary effort is really about going above and beyond for the sake of the organization. So when we, when we kind of think about low engagement and low discretionary effort, you'll see on the, on the slide kind of a graph that shows what we consider when employees feel like they're doing just what they have to do, you know, the bare minimum, only, only what their job title tells them they're supposed to do. And when people are doing that, that's not very effective for the organization. So really what engagement gets us is this idea of high discretionary effort. And this is when people want to do things. They want to go above and beyond. They're energized. They're passionate. They're committed to the, everything that they're doing. And when they do this, you start to see some really interesting behaviors. When this engagement's high, when discretionary effort's high, you start to see that they're not just working for the paycheck. They're willing to put in extra hours without complaining. They go the extra mile. They think of customers and their experience very personally and want to know what they want rather than just get them something and get them off the phone. They think of the money of the organization just like it's their money. They, so they, they're, they're, they're cost thoughtful. They put in more hours and they tend to work more efficiently. So there's all these great things that high engagement gets you when you get this discretionary effort. And so, you know, this is something you would expect and want for everyone. And if you want to test this out for yourself, in your next inter interview, ask someone, when was the time you were most engaged? Talk, tell me about it. And what you're not going to hear in those stories is about a time when people are bored, sitting around happy, doing nothing. What you're going to hear is stories about when they were working their hardest, they were feeling positive energy, they were feeling challenged, they were putting in extra hours, but they were doing their best work. And so that's what engagement is really about, is getting to that state of mind that can be really successful for employees. And when you get it right, engagement leads to big things for companies. Now, on this slide, you're going to see a lot of data. I'm not going to read it all to you. But first off, just as a whole, when we look at really, well, really highly engaged organizations, they outperform others in terms of things that matter, like net profits, shareholder return. Further, there's tons of other kinds of evidence that plenty of research companies have done that continues to show, hey, if you get this right, you're going to see a lot of positive returns. And, and it's in everything from productivity to sales to turnover. Everything, again, you'd want to see from your human capital improving improves when people are engaged. So it, it makes sense. Why would, we, why would we not want to have this right? And even with all the evidence of the positives that exist, the truth is, is only about 55% of companies have a strategy to fix engagement and their engagement problems. So despite where a lot of times, and I've, I've worked with a lot of companies where CEOs and executives say their most important part of their whole company is their people, when it comes down to it, they don't have an actual strategy that, that those strong statements have been transformed into. And the problem is even worse. Um, in some cases, we've research that shows that 98% of CEOs don't really even pay attention to engagement data. Now, this is just one study that may exaggerate it a little, but when I, when I saw this slide and when we put this together, I mean, personally, I've been in front of Fortune 50 company CEOs many times, and you can always tell how important the survey is by the amount of time you get on the calendar. And oftentimes, I'd be sitting out there in, in my suit and my getting prepared uh, approach and, and looking at the board and knowing I'm walking into the CEO's office, and their meeting beforehand would run, run long. And then I would be told, by the way, you've only got 45 minutes. And I would think, 45 minutes to talk about the, entire, the health of your entire human capital. Um, how serious is this really being taken? So what do most companies do? Well, there's really a common strategy that starts with surveys. And surveys are usually done in the annual approach, an annual census survey. It's designed to get a good understanding of the attitudes and views of the employee or really just an overall sense of the people health of a company. Um, 
you know, when they we start to see today that that's starting to transition more to things like um, real time surveys and poll surveys. But the idea is is to measure the the sentiment or the opinions of employees to get a sense of what's on their head minds and and what could be better in order to to, to make their worlds uh, you know better at work. Once all this data is collected, the next thing that most companies do is enter what's called the action planning phase. And the action planning phase is it's supposed to be a really high effort thing that everybody in the organization gets into. And it usually looks something like a top-down approach where senior executives look at data and they're supposed to communicate the results, decide on actions, communicate those actions, and make sure those actions take place throughout the entire organization. And at the same time, there's a bottoms-up approach where managers all over are supposed to receive their own results, sit down with their employees, talk to them, and do the same thing. Ultimately, the goal is really two things. One of them is to enact real change, and the second one is just simply to show that employees that that employees have spoken and that leaders have listened. But the truth is, is that if you look at any of the companies that track engagement year over year, like Gallup, even with this approach being the most common and used most frequently, it's just not working. The numbers are just not going up. So. You know, the real thing that we, we, we want to talk about and the really important point we want to hammer home is the failure oftentimes comes from the idea that while it's okay to measure at the group level, it is not okay to try to take action across a large group. You just can't move the needle on engagement just using a one-size-fits-all approach that fails to take into consideration who employees really are as individuals. Individuals have different needs. Employees have different motivations. They have different work experiences. They work with different people. And it's critical if you're going to get engagement right and you're going to build an engagement strategy to recognize that the individual and the individual approach to engagement needs to be taken into mind when doing things. As an example, um, many surveys will clearly say, hey, you know, engagement will really go up if your employees feel more recognition and feel more valued. But that's a group-level analysis. Once you get down to the individual level, you start to find out that if you start to recognize everyone the same, there's a lot of people who hate to see their names in lights, who don't want public recognition, who want you to just give them a soft pat on the back and that's all they need. And the idea of being publicly recognized is fear, is, puts fear in them and causes them to want to leave and disengage. Even though the, rest of the results say those things are important, the individual side needs to be thought of. So since attacking the engagement challenge at the individual level is really important, I'm now going to bring Mike in to take the discussion further. And Mike has a lot of experience transforming family and founder-run companies into high growth and highly engaged businesses. And so this gives him a lot of perspective on what works and what doesn't when it comes to tackling the individual side of engagement. Mike? Great. Thank you, Greg. Um, you know, and if, if, um, you know, if we had a thesis statement for this uh, you know, for this talk, it's really that while well, you can measure measure across the company, it's, you, you really need to deal with these things individually. And, and therefore, you know, we really want to give you, um, you know, sort of a two-minute primer in a way to understand uh, an individual's drives, needs, and preferred, you know, work styles. Um, you know, we would, we would make the argument that the human is the most complicated device on the planet and we don't come with instructions. We'd like to give you a little insight into this. There's going to be a payoff, so we're going to go into a little bit of the inside baseball. Uh, there's going to be a payoff uh, with some data into how this works. So the, the PI behavioral assessment, um, you know, measures four common behavioral drives that you see in the workplace: uh, dominance, extroversion, patience, and formality. Uh, when you see it on the, uh, you know, when when something is, well, I'd like to use myself as an example. This is my behavioral pattern. Um, now, the, the irony here is the very first time I took the predictive index uh, was over 10 years ago in my very first Vistage meeting. I walked into the meeting as a, as a new member. Uh, there were 15 of my peers uh, in the room. I didn't even know I took the, the PI survey. And one of my peers did a readback of my behavioral results. And I felt like he talked to my mother and knew things about me that, you know, I, I didn't really want to tell anyone, things that I probably didn't even like admitting to on a 360-degree review. And, you know, this is the pattern that he read, and it was something that I'm a high-dominance person. Um, when, it, when dominance is high, the red line, that is something that I am someone who needs to make an impact on my environment. 
as opposed to when dominance is low, you, you find someone who is more collaborative, more of a natural team player, seeking out more harmonious. Um, on, the, on the extroversion line, you can see I'm, I'm high on extroversion, where we labeled it B. Um, this is easier for most people to understand. They understand extroversion and introversion. I think the difference is when it's high extroversion in our model, it's really influencing people to a positive response and the need to communicate versus low on the extroversion scale is time to think through people uh, and more working solid in, in a more solitary environment. Patients, um, you can see here I'm labeled very low on the patients, uh, very common in the, uh, in, the, in the Vistage CEO network uh, for entrep typically entrepreneurial fast growth companies. You want things done uh, when it's low. You want a lot of pace, a lot of variety. Uh, when patience is high, you have people much, much more accustomed to familiarity and process and uh, more responsive to their environment. And finally, on the, on the form formality dimension, uh, when it's low in formality, it's, it's, it's less data, less attention to detail, more casual in your approach, more risk tolerant. When it's high in formality, it's about uh, perfection. It's about structure and rules. So this gives you a, you know, a, a quick two-minute outline of uh, the sort of behavioral model that we're going to talk about. Um, like to dive into, once we understand the individual, we can see how the individual actually fits into their workplace uh, and how they're engaged in their workplace, or in some instances, how they are in fact disengaged by work environmental pressures. And what we'd like to do today is, is dive into four specific examples of environmental pressures that individuals feel within their workplace that are very relevant to their overall engagement within their, with, within their workspace. Uh, this, this primarily is job fit, manager impact, culture, and team dynamics. So we're going to walk through, you know, many case studies in each of these work environmental pressure, pressures to show disengagement forces that can be directly addressed. Uh, so first, starting with job, job fit. Um, this is literally one of the most important elements to get right. Um, sometimes it's self-selecting and people later in their careers figure out a job that fits for them, but certainly early in their careers um, or if they get transferred or moved, the job fit can be you know, inappropriate. So the disengagement forces uh, with, with this particular dimension is really when there's a misalignment between your natural tendencies and your, your key responsibilities of the job. So in order to understand this, we really have to say, what are, in fact, the key responsibilities or behavioral uh, demands of that job? So what we wanted to do is start with a position that we could all become really, fam they were all really familiar with right off the bat. So we chose a sales hunter who was telephonically based. You know, what are the requirements of this job at a, at a, at a behavioral level? You know, certainly you would say that a sales hunter, someone responsible for new revenue, uh, needs to uh, quickly connect with people, someone who is a natural juggler and has a pace, uh, someone who has a goal orientation, you certainly need to meet your monthly, quarterly, and annual, you know, sales targets, someone who has, a, you know, a risk-tolerant leaning, they wouldn't be able to deal with the variable pay or the uncertainty in their pay. Um, and sort of the incentives required to be a good sales hunter, someone who is self-motivated, self-driven. And when you distill those, those strings uh, into, back into our behavioral profile, you come up with a pattern that looks much like this. And, you know, interestingly, it, it looks much like my pattern. And most of my career I've been in an outward-facing either sales or promotional type role, even if I was – you know, a senior executive or at the C level, uh, it was one where I was driving revenue. So it, it's not surprising where you have someone who is slightly, slightly dominant, uh, highly extroverted, very impatient, but with enough formality that they could have an, enough follow up attention to detail, fill out their sales pipeline mm -hmm. and the data required. So we see this being a very, very common uh, job pattern. And, uh, you know, we've done multiple validity studies proving just that. But we wanted to dive in and say, what about the, uh, what about the person? Here we have a schematic uh, person named Heather. She is a sales hunter, telephonically based. Um, and Heather is actually modeled after a, an acquaintance of mine. Uh, we didn't want to use uh, real face, real name. But, you know, this person um, 
is someone who does, in fact, seek results. So check, this would be a great person for sales. Someone who likes perfection. No one is, no one is going to complain about perfection. Uh, but someone who is um, task over people. And that's our, that's our first warning sign. Um, and we'll dive into what that means. And someone who's a little bit slower to connect with individuals. Well, backing again into the behavioral uh, pattern construct, you see that Heather's pattern um, you know, looks like this, and there's a slight mismatch to the ideal pattern. We're going to dive into a couple of these elements. Task versus people orientation. This is something that can really be determined by the AB relationship, which is the dominant extroversion, extroversion relationship. When the A drive, which is the dominance drive, is greater than the B drive, which is the extroversion drive, you end up getting someone who's dominant more important than extroversion, they have a leaning towards planning, analysis, problem solving, and synthesizing ideas. Now, when you have someone whose extroversion drive is higher than their dominance drive or their need to make an impact, you have someone who has a tendency towards communicating, motivating, team building, and trusting. Um, and you see here that you know Heather is certainly task focused, where the job requirement uh, of the telephonic based sales is in fact uh, uh, people focused. And when you, look at, when you look at her structure, uh, you're actually looking at almost a two, two sigma spread between her A and her B, where A is higher than B. And then, you know, Heather is really someone who is all about the task. I wanted to dive into one more element here, uh, the speed with which you typically make connections with people. When you are highly extroverted, um, yet uh, very impatient, you get this, this combination creates someone who has a tendency to be lively, enthusiastic, optimistic, and you know, stimulating in their approach uh, to communicating. Um, when you look at someone who has uh, you know, high patience um, with a lower extroversion, someone who takes an approach where more reserved, uh, more serious in their approach, uh, more introspective and quiet, this person doesn't mean they don't create deep connections, it just takes them a, a little bit longer, uh, in fact, to get there. Heather, certainly being on the slow to connect side where the job is requiring a quick to connect side. And she is, she's, she's all about that with uh, you know, a, a little over a sigma spread uh, with those drive dimensions. So I wanted to just lay out you know, Heather overlaid versus the position. Um, you know, Heather is, uh, is an, in, an intense person. She's very intelligent, has an MBA, has been doing sales the majority of her life. But, you know, Heather is required to stretch and modify, you know, significantly, you know, her need to connect with people via, you know, communication. She needs to become much more impatient. She, she in fact, has a, you know, I put a, put a yellow mark there. She has a little movement on the formality required. But the way, the way I look at this is, um, let's, let's take this as being ambidextrous. If I ask anyone on the phone to write with their off hand, so if you're a righty, if I asked you to work today with your left hand, you could do it. You could, in fact, spend your entire day working with your left hand. It would be frustrating. Your, your pace would be slower. Uh, your work output would be lower quality. Uh, your hand would start cramping because those muscles aren't used to doing that dexterous you know, amount of work, you'd have to take more breaks. This is what, in fact, happens when you get someone out of pre preference with respect to their behavior. So even if Heather is one of the most diligent employees, you know, this is something that does not come naturally to them. Um, you know, my particular acquaintance who is in a sales hunting position for over 10 years, uh, upon further counsel, Heather is a great fit for more of a technical sales or an imp say, uh, implementation role post-sales, where it's uh, more specific and detail-oriented, uh, suggested to the real Heather that this is something they should do. And in that fit, they were, you know, uh, you know immensely more satisfied with the day-to-day. With the -day. And many stress, stressors and pressures came off of, of, of the real Heather. Now we'd like to, to dive into the manager impact. We've heard, you know, anecdotally that, you know, people often quit managers, you know, quit companies. Um, and this is, this is very true, you, you, whether it's a new manager or a manager who's been giving a new initiative or, it, or uh, uh, has, has increased focus on something uh, with respect to change management. And it's really a misalignment between the manager and the self. 
um, we want to take you through uh, some management style because it's important to understand management style. Now, a great predictor of your management style will, in fact, be uh, your highest drive. So if you are a highest drive individual, you tend to have an or authoritative or telling style. I call this, I often refer to this as the, the general patent style. It's, you know, you're, you're in the turret of the tank, you tell the team attack the hill, the team attacks the hill, and you're right there with them. Um, and it's no nonsense, very direct in style. The, uh, the highest B management style is that of, a, you know, a, really a persuasive style. I often refer to this as the Martin Luther King, I have a dream style. You paint the picture, you paint the vision, you align people through communication about and around the vision. You persuade them into why we're doing this. You lead with the cell, you create that vision, and you march forward together. And, and that is a, a, a very popular style for highest B individuals. The highest C um, leaders in management style, you often see this in, in rooms uh, like software work, uh, accounting rooms, uh, manufacturing floors, where it's really about process. It's about following a process. It's learning from experience. It's bringing experience to bear. These leaders, are, these leaders often are found saying, well, in my experience, this is how we should approach this. It's about familiarity. Um, it's a much more patient style towards, um, towards movement about realigning with process. And, and lastly, we have, uh, you know, highest C management style. Uh, it's about structure and rules. Um, you know, really believe this to be uh, the Henry Ford style. You can have any color car you want, as long as it's black. Uh, eked out performance with, uh, with rules and structure around manufacturing. And it is, uh, it is very data-driven. It is very rules-based, and it is about perfection. Now, uh, the, the old axiom of do unto others as you would have them do unto you. While this is a fantastic way to live your life, this is certainly not a fantastic way in which to manage people. Um, I, I, make, I make a parallel. You know, great teachers, uh, good teachers can teach a subject, you know, one way extremely well. Great teachers can teach a subject as many ways as needed so that each of the students can learn the subject matter. And I think some of that is also true for management style. You really have to modify yourself as the manager to the needs, drives, and um, you know, behavioral preferences of your employees. So in order to do that, you have to understand what are your, what are your employees' needs. And uh, again, needs can often be um, quickly you know, determined by the highest drive. If you have a high A individual, they need to make an impact. Um, they, need, they need to put their thumbprint on things. They need to be doing something that they consider to be meaningful. This doesn't mean 24-7, uh, but if you need to manage someone that needs to make an impact, you have to give them wiggle room in order to give them a thumbprint on something. Uh, high B individuals, they want feedback. They want to communicate. High C individuals, they need time. They need time to process. They need time to think. Uh, they need time to get used to the new way of order. Uh, high D individuals need more details, they need more structure, they need more rules, they need to be explained what perfect is. Um, and in this, in this example I'd like to show you, we've got Alan, head of sales, he's been in the company and in the industry for a long time, he knows everyone. He's someone who needs feedback, um, he, he needs an opportunity to communicate and influence, and he wants people connection. Well, income comes Mark, the new CEO, and you can see Mark is, you know, all, all business. Uh, he even has an arrogant way of tying his tie. Uh, you know, he's, he's direct, uh, data-oriented, and very operationally focused. Mark comes in and, you know, jumps on Alan, and they have, you know, definitely different behavioral styles. As I said, Alan, the top curve, uh, he is all about people. He wants feedback. He wants to communicate, and, you know, Mark, the CEO, he's about making an impact. He's impatient about that. He is going to be very direct in his approach, and they are going to have, uh, you know, quite a bit of, um, they're going to have quite a bit of friction on their A and B dimension. You know, if Mark, unaltered, will just keep hammering on Alan, uh, Alan wants positive feedback, does not want to be hammered, and, um, you know, 
they have different needs, they have different behaviors, and we know how this is going to end. You know, Alan is going to um, Alan is going to either leave the company, find a new job elsewhere in the industry, likely with a competitor, or Mark is going to ask Alan to leave. And this one is it's the onus is on both of them to communicate this to each other. But the ultimate onus is, is really on Mark, the leader. You know, the, the great leader needs to modify their style. And we often ill-prepare our managers uh, into their management roles. They, they think, do unto others as I would want done unto me. So they manage everyone the way they would like to be managed, and they don't modify their style. Um, and this is a tremendous stressor when a new manager comes in, uh, implements their style on the team, and you can have these hot spots of, of of disengagement. So the employee needs really comes first, and you know we need to coach all of our managers up to understand first their self awareness of their own needs, but then the needs of their behaviors and how they would love like prefer to operate. Um, because Greg is a culture expert, I'd love to toss this back over to Greg to take us through uh, the culture example. Greg, thanks, Mike. Um, I'm going to start by saying that we all heard the saying, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And really the same can be true about individuals. Culture can eat people's engagement for breakfast, lunch, and dinner too. And so when people are aligned with the culture, it's really an easy recipe for success. We've all seen it or hope that we've seen it where decisions and actions and behaviors that people at all levels take are rewarded. And everyone feels that their contribution and approach is valued. But a perfectly aligned culture is really challenging, if not impossible. And so the disengagement force is when people work in a culture that expects them to be a lot different than they really are. And when they feel this, it's a great recipe for quick disengagement. So to illustrate this story, we're going to use Predictive Index's own reality. And what you're going to see on this is actually a real picture of our offices. And you'll see two things, developers and management, which is actually how the or where the different groups sit um, generally. And we're going to talk a little bit about how uh, the senior leaders of a company, just like PI, are largely responsible for setting the tone, the climate, major parts of the culture through actions, behaviors, and decisions. So we've got the management who has a style and a way about them that largely defines what we see in the organizational culture. And on the other side of the equation, we have our development team. And for PI, this is a high-performing group who are of major strategic investment and are absolutely mission critical to our success. So let's talk a little bit about the development team to start. Our development team looks a lot like a development team should. As the group, you'll see that they're very high on this patience and formality factors, which means that largely they're about doing things right, doing things procedurally, doing things structured, getting things done on time and with few errors. You'll also see that the low B, for example, means that they're not a largely extroverted group of people. They're not out socializing, looking for fun, needing a bunch of enthusiastic conversation. They like to put their heads down, work on their own, and succeed in that way. So in short, you know, these are a group of developers that are experts in their craft, and they know how to get it done right. Now, the PI management team on the other side um, is quite the opposite. It is a, a group of risk takers. You'll see the low D and low C. So they're risk takers. They're very intense. Uh, we're very high-paced about things. Um, we like to be somewhat, when you look at the A and the B, aggressive and social. We verbalize a lot of things. So as a leadership team, what this pattern of, of managers together starts to feel like for a company is that these people see these behaviors, the, the, uh, the high-pacedness, the intensity, the, the risk-taking, and they start to see that that's how leaders behave, so that's how we're expected to behave. So you have these two different sides that when you look at them together, the executive team, again, which is proactive and impatient, risk-tolerant, verbal, and less formal, versus a development team that's rules-based and patient and structured and very heads down, and you look at the difference, and they couldn't be any further apart. So you start to say, how does this rule-based, patient-structured group exist in a culture that's led and, and, and designed around this high-paced, proactive, risk-tolerant, kind of more aggressive people? 
if you're thinking about what it would feel like without the right things in place, it would probably be a lot of frustration. Frustration and stress when you want to do things the way you're meant to do things, and the culture keeps asking you to do them differently. Go, we need to do things slow and methodically. We need you to do them faster. And we're having social time, and you're not there. And little by little, people will start to get frustrated. And, and we've all seen this when you don't fit with the right culture, how it, everything can start to, to build up, and it just doesn't feel like the place you want to be. So what do you do? Well, first you have to understand what we've been talking about, which is this individual side of engagement, and that the development team, in order to be successful, needs to be allowed to be who they are. And that means that you, there needs to be thoughts about creating protective pieces of from the culture in the right ways that protect them from the bad parts of the culture that might slow them down so that they can flourish. And that's about thinking about the work environment and crafting it appropriately so you don't lose talent. On the right side, sorry, on the right side, you have leaders who have an important side to this role too. And in this case, PI is literally set up the developers in their own space, keeping them away from all the noise and all the social people so that there's very few disruptions. Their room is actually darker. They have headphones on. And in many ways, figuratively and literally, they've, we've worked with them to give them a wall away from some of the aspects that could be disengaging. In addition, there are two managers that sort of sit in between that translate the messages that come from the leadership, that come from the culture, and they moderate the effects. And so this gives another buffer to kind of keep the negative pull that they could be feeling from the culture out of the way. And so when you think about your own organizations, and the point about this is that culture is a very strong force. And you want people to be aligned where they can be. But there are going to be functions who need to be allowed to be who they are, to be individuals in order to be successful at what they do. And by attacking the individual side of the engagement equation, it's possible to think about and do things that are, can avoid the disengagement and set things up right so that people are engaged and can do the amazing work rather than just feel like a square peg in a round hole all the time. So for the next part of this, Mike's going to take back over, and he's also going to use the PI management team as an example, so it's appropriate that he gives his rundown through that. Mike? Great. Thank you, Greg. Um, it, is, it is nice to, to be able to use the PI management team uh, for this particular example. Um, really, the major disengagement force here is when you feel as a person uh, or people that you are not uh, like the team and that there are uh, frictions in how you work problems down. Um, I would like to use as an example, this is my business partner, Daniel. We've, um, we've known each other uh, since grad school, and uh, we've been business partners for 15 years. Uh, he's the president of the Predictive Index. While I have the CEO title, we are peers. We, we run the company together. I tend to be the outside guy. He is the inside guy. Tremendous trust and respect of each other. But over this period of time, I've come to realize, you know, Daniel is, you know, driven, very dominant in his approach. Uh, he, he tends to be reserved, uh, yet very fast-paced with a, in, in intensity to him. And he is about uh, more formal, uh, and following established rules. And what you end up seeing is, here's a, here's a picture at, at a recent offsite we did with the senior management team. Uh, Daniel and I are in the kayaks down below, and you're looking at the group uh, analytics of all of our behavioral patterns. Uh, and in general, as Greg pointed out in the, last, uh, in the last example, this is a highly extroverted, lower attention to detail, brainstorming, impatient culture. Um, Yet when I when I flash to you, you know Daniel. There's the average of our team, and there's Daniel. You know Daniel has this. Uh, he's a, he's a, he's a bit of an outlier. He is he's the most aggressive person on our team. Uh, in in when I when I think of three sigma high A dominance, I think of one sigma as you want. Uh, Two sigma is need, and this three sigma is he's got to bleeping ha make an impact. And when you meet him, he, he has that, that intensity to him. He also uh, likes to think before speaking, uh, which means sometimes he has trouble getting airtime in our management meetings because the majority of the management team is, uh, is, is feeling all the air. Uh, and he is certainly more data-driven. 
Uh, we are, in fact, very aligned on the impatience. But, you know, three of these dimensions, data feel, uh, Daniel feels like he's, he's, he's a little bit uh, out uh, from the rest of us. And one of the elements is when you have an individual, now it may not be the president of the company, but it could be an individual or individuals, do they feel like a black sheep um, and could they feel like a savior? And, you know, we point out that it's, uh, it's, it's really important that both the team and the outlier, in this case Daniel, must be aware of the differences and how these can be used as an advantage. And in, in fact, Daniel is the single most important member of our management team. And it's because he challenges us. We are a relatively homogenous team, and he challenges us to think a little bit differently. He challenges us uh, you know, to think before we speak. He challenges us around data. Um, he, he, pushes back pretty hard on our, on our new ideas, and we thought through those fully. So I would encourage you, if you have the opportunity, when you look at your team, um, whether you're using you know, analytics or not, but it's to say if you think you have some people who are black sheep you, or potential black sheep, you need to uncover um, and unlock some value here. And I'm sure we've all been at meetings where you have had a world-class meeting, some heated debate, and you went back to your desk, and literally 10 minutes after the meeting, someone sent you an email with, which said, I didn't have an opportunity to say this, but I just wanted to point out X, Y, or Z. And it was a point that would have changed the course of the discussion of that meeting. Now, as the leader of the organization, that's on you. You had a person in there who obviously was either low dominance or low extroversion and didn't feel comfortable enough to get that point across. It's your responsibility as a leader to take that black sheep and make them the savior and give them an environment, provide that environment, coach the rest of the members of that team, give that to, to enable that those key things to come out in real time. So you as a leader don't have to circle back and have a second or a third meeting or do all sorts of shopping around of this, this idea that came in, you know, 10 minutes too late. So wanted to dive into that final team dynamics. And, and you, can, you can really see the, the power of, um, of understanding the individual uh, in, the, in, in the quite, quite literal, um, you know, the, the, the pressure of either job fit, uh, you know, impact of manager, impact of culture, and impact of team dynamics. Um, so, Greg, I'd uh, love to pass it off to you to sort of wrap, wrap this up a bit. Great. Thank you, Mike. Now, in closing, the reason we're talking about this is because even if you just look at the cost of disengaged managers in the U.S., the costs are gigantic. It's billions and billions of dollars that are going out the window because companies just aren't getting this right, and they're not finding ways to engage their valuable employees. If you look at the turnover that's often associated with low engagement or disengagement, you've got another $11 billion that it's lost. So that's a pretty significant and daunting challenge that has real business implications. So what we've shown you today is what we think is a major step forward in tackling the engagement challenge. Sure, you can do an annual census survey. If you can gather data at the group level to get a pulse of what's going on, in fact, we recommend that. You should know what's going on. But it's only when you take the time to start to understand behavior at the individual level and use that information to consider the job and the job design, the manager style versus the employee needs, the cultural pressures of different functions versus that of the leadership team, and how individuals work through team dynamics. Are, you, are they black sheep or are they saviors? If you start to do that, you can start to tailor the environment in the right way for the right people. And you know what? Not only will you create a more engaged workforce by just understanding and acting on these things, but just the act of showing your employees that you're going to take the individual level, to show them that you're taking the interest and effort to understand them and try to make things better, will by itself have a very positive impact on engagement of employees because they'll see you're investing in them and that you do have concern to make things right. In the end, getting started in this, despite all the things we've covered, is really quite easy. Pick a team or two, figure out who they are, what they need, how well they are aligned to each other, the job, the managers, the culture, 
and use that to start to enact some positive change, what you'll find is that engagement is actually fairly infectious. And, and as people become more engaged, it starts to exponentially increase in an organization. And if you can get it right with just a small group or a couple of groups, it'll start to spread. And then more people will want to do the same thing. And little by little, an organization will go from not thinking about the individual at all to thinking about the individual and their needs and all of the pieces we talked about every day as part of how they operate their people strategy and even their business strategy. And in the end, engagement will start to creep higher and higher. Those numbers will go, over, go up, and as they do, so will the business results. So as you'll see on the screen, if you are interested in, in trying PI with a team today, you can actually click right on that purple box right on the webinar, um, and it'll take you to a page that can get you started. And with that, I'm going to close it and say thank you so much for listening and turn it over to Dave to handle the question and answer session. Excellent. So uh, let's jump in with the Q&A. And, um, folks, if you want to um, put a question in for consideration, please type it in the WebEx panel titled Q&A. If you're not seeing the um, actual box to enter it in, there's probably a little arrow that you can click, and it will change from a sideways to a drop-down. So please type in your questions. So uh, first one I'll go with, and what I'll do is I'll just let either one of you jump in. So I'll leave it to you to, to decide. Um, what are your thoughts about routine performance reviews, annual reviews, 360 uh, processes? Does that help or hurt engagement? And what's the current thinking on those things anyway? Great. You want to jump in on that one? Sure, I'll take that. Well, right now the world is realizing that routine performance appraisals, while well-intentioned, have a lot of negative effects. In fact, some of the research even shows that people who are the high performers um, feel guilt and only feel a burst of positive engagement when, they, when their reviews are done, only to go into a stressful period of either guilt because they feel the process wasn't fair to others, um, and that's even the best one. I think that the, con the performance management is shifting and, and needs to change to being very much about some of the things we talked about today. I mean, whether or not PI is involved, it's about sitting down and understanding what people are doing, what they need, who they are, uh, having it being more of a coaching and management discussion, and using that as a way to truly move performance and also to be more in tune with who people are versus trying to assign them numbers. Um, and, and, in fact, those numbers oftentimes are, are full of, of politics where you don't want to, you know, you know that they're associated with compensation and promotion, and so you're, you're giving them just as reason to give people certain things like, I need this person to get a raise this year. So I think that mainly moving away from the idea of annual performance appraisals is going to improve engagement, and having more conversations and getting at this individual side is really where it's at. Excellent. Uh, a couple of people asked sort of similar um, questions or different versions of uh, related questions, including uh, Don, who just put one in, or Donald, perhaps. And um, it, one version of the question was, are there certain things in the work environment that are um, very typical for causing disengagement? What should we be, you know, looking out for as the uh, more common issues? And um, uh, put a different way, what happens when people believe they have too much work? Uh, is that something that is a typical disengager? And how do you engage people who otherwise feel maybe they're, they're being overworked? Uh, Greg, let me grab the, the, the second half of that uh, first, and you can, you can think maybe about the first half of the, the typical engagement one. But, you know, I, I look at this, this overwork element. Certainly, you know, um, no one is accusing the modern world uh, of being slow-paced. Um, even in our own um, surveying that we do here, we're bordering, uh, we bump up here at a high, with a high-performance culture of people feeling um, not low scores, but our lowest scores are people saying, I wish I had a little more time to finish my work. Um, and. It, it, it certainly is an issue that challenges everyone. Now, I will go to, you know, there's some, you know, really good psychological work done on, uh, on the concept of flow, um, or some of you may have heard of it about uh, being in the zone. Um, at the time when people feel, you know, high degrees of satisfaction with the work they're doing, 
they sort of lose track of time. Um, they're all, it's not that they're having an out-of-body experience. But they're so into their work uh, that you know time time goes by. They either you know really quickly or stand still. And it's often um, linked to really high levels of enjoyment when you're in flow or in the zone. And you know people do that while doing you know intense activities, while doing some sort of activity. They don't they don't do that doing nothing. So I, I would actually say that you could certainly have you know an overworked population that has too much to do, and you've been keeping the pressure on you know, far too long, you're doing 70 plus hour weeks, you know, week in and week out. But if you have an individual who you, you feel, you know, is using this example of, uh, of, you know, I have too much work to do, there may be a misalignment in the type of work that they're doing uh, or some operational elements. They're always the person maybe making up for other, other team members. Uh, but typically you can have very engaged people who are incredibly busy um, and who, who, who say that the, the, the quantity of their work, while high, is very, very satisfying. Um, you know, Greg, you've got some deep knowledge around, you know, flow and being in the zone, as well as you, the first part of that question, which is what, what are some typical, you know, disengagement elements in the workplace? Well, you know, what you really find a lot of times at the very highest level is people need basically to feel valued by their leadership of their company, feel like they play for a winning team, so to trust for the senior leaders, feeling valued, and that's, that's a huge part of an engagement equation. And it's not just about trust. Um, it's about confidence that they're confident. It's about seeing that, they, that leaders all across the organization respect employees enough to communicate, be transparent, trust them with information, think about them first versus making you know, business decisions. A lot of times I'll find companies who will say, well, Greg, we were uh, we just cut benefits for our entire workforce. Is it really time to do the engagement survey? Because you know I think they're going to be lower scores. And you're like, well, darn right they're going to be lower scores. You made a financial decision that is financially beneficial versus people oriented. So that's how engagement works. So I think a lot of times the very higher order part of it is that sense, no matter what is going on, about feeling valued and respected. And on, just to add to the disengage, disengagement side, even things like work-life balance and compensation, sometimes there's this thing called hygiene factors, and there are things that you've got to get about right in order for people to get to the next level and to sort of really engage. So if people come to work every day and they feel like they are, you know, they're, they're skipping by on pay or, or they're having medical issues and their benefits aren't enough or, you know, their families they can't be there for their families, you know, there are – those things can – can cause it so that people really can't engage because those things are more prevalent in their minds. But ultimately, a lot of people will say, you know, well, isn't compensation a big part of engagement, for example? And the, the truth is, is that it never is the high, it's never on the list of what engages people, but it is on what's on the list of what people say when they become disengaged. And it sounds a lot like, you know what? I don't get paid enough to put up with this stuff. And that's, all, that's when compensation and work-life balance and benefits oftentimes show up on the list. Fabulous. Hey, for folks who are asking for a copy of the PDF, I just want to point out if you open up the chat panel, Colleen from Vistage has posted a link that you can click and get a PDF copy of the slides. And um, I'll cover where you can get it uh, also on the Vistage website when I do the wrap-up at the end. All right, so this is a very specific question, but I want to go to it because it's actually a problem all of us have. The question is, uh, we have a 200-person employee accounting or account servicing center, while most companies like us tend to hire experienced people, we put most of our effort into de developing folks from the entry level. In other words, we've made a big investment in our people, maybe more so than some of our competitors. Now, one of our direct competitors is moving in literally next door to us, sharing a wall, double the space. Um, how should we handle this situation? And the reason I think it's an interesting question is we all face this threat of uh, competitors raiding us. You know, most people are listed on LinkedIn and so on. So uh, what are your thoughts just on that so that uh, when we do make an investment in our employees, it is best possible predicted or protected? Uh, I'd love to, love to take the, the front half of this. Um, we, just, we just moved into a building and uh, into a new complex in, in Boston. 
I wanted to make the point that it does not need to be a direct competitor. Um, we, um, you know, we're in this new development. We are a pretty hip and cool company, or we certainly think so. We, you know, have won some awards for best places to work, and we have a good, fun, healthy culture. We literally have people knocking on our door, uh, just saying, "What do you do? I want to work here." So, it, it, one, it does not have to be a direct competitor. Um, so, uh, it, I think it, it feels more acute, and it will be more of an emotional element when it is a direct competitor. Uh, because you think it's it's certainly more seamless, but the fact of the matter is the opportunity uh, out there for for employment is you're always under that pressure, and this is when the rubber meets the road. I mean, if you the one of the ultimate signs of you know total engagement is what is your voluntary turnover, and if you have people leaving in droves, whether it's to a direct competitor uh, or not, if you have a you know high churn. Um, which is not by you, but by the employee's choice, you, you, you certainly have some form of engagement culture issue. Um, I look at this, um, that when, when you have, uh, when you're doing the engagement piece, right, you have literally low single digit turnover rates. People really want to work with you, work there. And uh, in, th in this particularly acute example with a direct competitor right next door, it reminds me of the parable of, you know, you know, two hikers walking into the woods and, you know, they see a bear and uh, one of them stops and puts on their running shoes. And he's like, you know, you can't outrun it. The other hiker's like, you can't outrun a bear. And he's like, I don't need to outrun the bear. I need to outrun you. So in this acute example, it's like, I hope that you have, you know, a better corporate culture, better engagement and, you know, a better overall value proposition, employment value proposition than your competitor. Uh, what you'll do is you'll lose your low-end talent to them, which would be great, so you'll fill your competitor with uh, your lower quartile, who is feeling pressure to get out anyway, and uh, you'll steal their best. Um, Greg, do you have any other elements on that that you might want to address? Uh, not really. I think, I think the idea of, you know, that unique value proposition is going to attract certain people, and you might lose some, and some of those people might be those that are disengaging because, they, you know, there isn't a great fit, and, and the effort to make them a great fit is, is tough. But it's then knowing that might be the opportunity to um, fill with new talent, like you were saying. So I think that's a great way of thinking about it. Let's uh, use one minute, 60 seconds, for one last question. We're in a world where the millennials are flooding into the workplace. Uh, it's December right now, so we are exactly uh, three years and one month away from 2020 when reportedly 49% of our workforce will be the millennials. What do you see changing? What, which we should be, what should we be paying attention to with respect to engagement with this newest generation? There's, there's, um, there's some, uh, actually a great write, uh, article um, by the CEO of LinkedIn, the founder and CEO of LinkedIn. He talks about um, you know, sort of this more millennial movement that, People, millennials, and even today, non-millennials, but uh, he's, your employment is really a tour of duty, uh, and you're going to have multiple tours in your career, um, and you, you really don't have a single career where you're staying uh, year in and year out. So whether it's, it's a millennial or not, uh, I think tours of duty at a specific company, um, they're getting shorter. Certainly with the millennials, uh, some of the elements that Greg talked about earlier, this, you know, trust, uh, transparency, feeling valued, and, um, you know, having some alignment with the mission of the company and that, you, you, you know, some companies, you know, it's easier for some. Uh, in, you know, it's, if you're rolling steel, as an example, it's harder to be aligned with the mission of the company. Um, I don't mean to pick on the steel industry, but it's, um, it, it may seem less of a, a mission-based organization. Greg, do you have, do you have specific thoughts on, on millennial data that you wanted to, you know, tie in? Um, a little bit of just that. I think that there is the idea of the career and the upward mobility becoming less a part of the, the things that people, millennials, are often looking for. They want more experiences and, as you said, the mission. And so it becomes really important on organizations not only to have a sometimes a little bit more of a 
of a, some heart to who they are, but also to think about how they can grow instead of the, the need to grow people upwards and the old hierarchical model. On, on really focusing on, on kind of growing them laterally, getting them experience, making them versatile, and that those types of things are tending to be more important for millennials. All right. Well, with that, we're up against the uh, clock. So, uh, Mike Zani and Greg Barnett, thanks so much for uh, joining us and uh, taking us through this topic. Folks, join us again uh, for, the, for the next two Fridays. We're back on December 9th in one week. Peter Lehrman is going to talk about deciding when to sell in today's economic climate. And on December 16th, Joanne Lublin and Diane Darling will discuss earning it, the obstacles facing women in the workplace. As always, you can register at vistage.com forward slash FWV. That's Fridays with Vistage, FWV. And that's a public site, so you can invite Co-workers and uh, compatriots don't even have to be a Vistage member to uh, register. And uh, for Vistage members, you can access past recordings and slides at vistage.com forward slash webinars. And I would definitely encourage you to go back and listen to the uh, August recording that Mike and Greg did together. So on behalf of Mike Zani and Greg Barnett and the entire team at Vistage International, I'm Dave Nelson. Thank you for joining us today. Have a great weekend.